Hi, welcome to House Healthcare. It's Tuesday, April 9th. Hopefully everyone saw the eclipse yesterday. It's pretty amazing. Um, we're continuing our designated agency and um, uh, assess a testimony this week. So today we have North Western Counseling and Support Services. So thank you so much for coming in person. Hopefully you were fine with traffic. A little hairy this morning. Um, so we have until 2.45 and I am going to turn it over to you. All right. Uh, my name is Todd Bauman. I'm the executive director at Northwestern Counseling and Support Services. We are the designated agency, the Community Mental Health Center serving Franklin and Grand Isle. Our scope is actually bigger than that, though, and we'll get into that a little bit when, when we present. Um, just from a little structure, just wanted to introduce... Um, I, I brought this yep. was total. Absolutely. And actually, once you, once you introduce, we'll introduce as well, because okay. I realize many of you haven't been here. I would so. appreciate that. Yep. So... Um, and can they speak about on the side? Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Stacey. Oh, hi. I'm Stacey Wemmelard. I'm the uh, HR director at Nelson and Sport in St. Albans. Great. Kim McClellan, I'm the chief operating officer. Uh, Matt Habedank, I'm the director of Children, Youth, and Families Division, which is kind of shifting a little bit. We're doing some restructuring. So, what you would traditionally know is Children, Youth, and Families. Okay. Um, Belinda Bissett, I am the Behavioral Health Director, Linda Ovid Bissett. Hi, nice. Penny. Nice. 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 Um, and like Matt said, we're doing some transitions, so I will soon to be uh, the Director of Child and Adult Mental Health at the agency. Right? Yes. Yeah, right, you want to start? Sorry. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the Art Peterson State Rep, uh, Rutland District 2, Clarity 1, and request for all the pizza ball. Leslie Goldman, Wyndham 3, Rockingham, Westminster, and Brookline, which is the Bellisville area. Tom and McFarlane. I represent Barrytown and a small piece of Williamstown. And Lori Houghton, I represent City of Essex Junction. And Alyssa Black, I represent Northern Essex. And I'll use Penny. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I'm Penny Dwyer. I represent Enosburg and Montgomery. <laughs> I'm Molly Carpenter. I am from Hyde Park and I represent Wolcott, Hyde Park, Johnson, and Belvedere. Okay. And, we, and we may have some people coming in and out. Um, it's it's a little busy for folks. So. And when people use their nicknames and their maiden names. Right. <laughs> mean something. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's so we miss this relationship here. Is there something? Um, I, yeah, he's known my parents my whole life. I grew up with Got it. I thought maybe his daughter in law or something. Um, okay, got it. I know his daughter in law. So. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And so we tried to structure it I, based on um, kind of the topics that we'll talk about, but we might swap people out a little bit. Perfect. Yeah, and it's fine if they also talk from the side. So however you want to handle it. Yep. Um, I was going to just leave with you put forth a series of questions that you want us to answer. And I thought your questions were really, really good. Um, again, it's kind of like your guiding principles. They were focused and looking for specific content, but they really did cover a wide variety, a wide breadth of supports that we offer. And so I just want to acknowledge that I thought your questions were great. We did submit them in writing and we took quite a bit of time. So it's, it's a lot of information, but we wanted to be really thorough and comprehensive. So you have those but then we're going to do a presentation that's more of an executive summary that's that perfect. we can kind of talk from. That's great. Thank you. Um, so we are the designated agency in Northwestern Counseling. We cover Franklin Grand Isle as our catchment area. And you'll hear people talk about core capacities or designated services. And I think that was one of the questions you did ask. And we do have core designated services that were mandated to provide from the state, in, in, it's actually in legislature, uh, legislative action. It's community rehabilitation treatment, CRT, children, youth, and family services, emergency services, and then we have a DS waiver program. <laughs> that is about two thirds of what we do. And we can go into a little more detail with those. But we really wanted to kind of cover some of the additional things we do, that additional one third. Um, and I see those things as um, making us a little bit different, making us stand out a little bit from our peers. Um, all of the designated agencies you'll hear, we have the same rules that we have to follow. We have the same core capacities we have to provide. But then we have some leeway that we can work with our community partners and really talk with them 
to find out what does our community need that might be different? What does St. Albans need that might be different from something that maybe is needed in Rutland? So we are able to work with our community partners to create something that's unique and that's special. And I see that as a real strength of the DA system. We have our core capacities where we're the same, but then we are different. And I see that as a real positive because we're able to meet our communities um, specifically. So um, some of the areas where I do think we are different, and I'll just kind of jump in, jump in anywhere. Um, and we've got our adult and children outpatient team, and that's kind of what you would picture the traditional 50 minute hour people coming in for therapy. It's individual, um, it's, uh, it's couples, it's group, it's all different kinds of um, outpatient therapy. Um, we have our school based services. Um, you want to just touch on those just real quickly in here? Is that success beyond six? Yes, yes. beyond six. Yep. Yeah, we have a, a good continuing, a continuing school based services that we've built uh, through the years. Um, we have kind of five, six main programs in there, uh, school-based clinicians, um, which is doing sort of the kind of the outpatient model in schools, although they do with some, some uh, homeschool coordination as pieces of that team as well. Uh, we have the PBIS consultant program. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that one. I think it, us in Washington County, I think are the only two D DAs that run that, uh, but that's a, a board certified behavior analyst or someone who's in a master's program getting ready to become or has passed their master's program uh, that's placed in a public school. Um, they carry a small case load of kids and do a lot of systems work on the, the PBIS systems in public schools. Can you say what PBIS is? Oh, positive behavior interventions and supports, um, which is uh, if you've heard of uh, MTSS, um, multi-tiered system of supports. Multi-tiered systems of supports is kind of, uh, PBIS is more behavioral and MTSS is kind of um, a, a melding of behavioral and academic both. Um, we have two one-to-one uh, -one behavior interventionist programs. Uh, one that serves largely kids you could kind of think of as a emotional behavior disorder, which is a special ed classification, uh, and one that works with kids it's called the Autism BI program. About half of the kids that are served by that team actually have an autism spectrum diagnosis. The other half are kids with a bunch of different sets of diagnoses that kind of benefit from that service modality and that level of support. Uh, and then we have our alternative school, uh, uh, approved independent school, which is SOAR Learning Center. Um, that's one of the larger um, alternative schools in the state. Uh, SOAR right now is at around the 60 kids um, enrollment, and I think can go up somewhere towards the 80 mark, you know, give or take a couple in there. Um, so those are our school-based services. And really that's everything from kind of uh, a lower level um, and a lot of preventative work, especially with the PBIS consultant program um, up through a full-blown alternative placement. So we really, um, we really build a system to try to meet the needs of the schools and the communities. Right. Are you comfortable if we stop and take questions and I'll Absolutely. monitor the time? So I'm going to go first. Um, Success Beyond Six, are you, Kate, are you fully funded, able to be in the schools with that program? We've heard from others where there's, you know, kind of a gap. They don't have the staff really to draw down the funds to fully do it. I, I would say um, there's a cap that we have that I think is sufficient for us to provide services, but the rate that we receive... <laughs> Um, is a little bit low, and that then sh we struggle to recruit the staff. Okay. So we do see, you know, off the like, top of your head, how many contracts were? Good question. Uh, if we think about BI programs, PBIS, and school-based behavior con consulting, we're probably at 60-ish, somewhere, maybe a little bit less. Maybe and, how about 50 right now. and if we were, when you think of the schools, making referrals to us, how many? Oh, it's probably about 80% of the schools in we don't in, in the two counties. Okay. About 80%. 80, about 80%. Schools, that have a contract with one of the other of those programs, not necessarily for all. And, and could yes. you, sorry to interrupt, um, this has become a real uh, topic around here because of the education finance funding situation we're in. Um, could, if you had a higher rate, could you hire, do you think you'd be able to hire more people to go into more schools? Yes, okay. we do. And, um, and how those people, we actually were just talking to Representative too. If he's on our board down in the cafeteria and he's in House Ed, um, we're going to connect with him on the side and talk about Success Beyond Six a little Great. bit. Um, what that would do, our inability to hire staff forces school, schools have to provide those services because these kids are not IEPs. They have no choice. So they have to pay whatever they need to pay to hire those services and, and put those uh, a one on one in with a classroom with a kid. They have to pay full when they hire that person themselves. 
If they partner with us, they just pay half because of our ability to access federal Medicaid dollars. So our inability to hire staff actually forces schools to pay more because they have to go with themselves. So that disconnect, I think, is partly why we're seeing the special ed um, costs kind of blow up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Is I think because our part, and we actually have a stat to show you, our partnerships have, have declined, especially during COVID, and we are working really hard with our schools to bring those back up to decrease special ed costs. So not not the topic now, but maybe later, it would be good to have a conversation about what exactly it would look like if we were to try to fully fund that and how it would affect your capabilities to be in the schools. So that'd be helpful. I will note that curve is starting to turn. You know, I think we came out of COVID and staffing, I think, continued to get a little bit worse post-COVID, but it feels like it's starting to head in the right direction. Right. Some of the numbers have started to come up. There are some key positions that are trickier to hire than others, but overall it's starting to bend slowly, more slowly than we'd like, but in the right direction. Okay. Good to hear. Leslie and then Art, and I just want to close this. <laughs> Mine's really quick. Um, I'm from the southern part of the state, so I just want to compare. So when you talk about an alternative school, is it equivalent to Kindle Farm? You know, that's a good question. I'm going to say yes. Mm -hmm. They might be subtly different, mm -hmm. but Kindle Farm is run by HCRS. Mm -hmm. It's an alternative independent school. Mm -hmm. I don't, it might be K, do you know the age range? I think it's more high school. It might be 7-12. We're K-12, so we might be a little broader that way, mm -hmm. but think of them as very similar. Okay. Similar payment structures. Yeah, they, I just wanted to understand. They'd be very similar. Okay, thank you. They do good work down there, too. I, that's yeah. what I'm here. I understand. Yeah, Art? Yeah, I, in the same vein, um, how does one get into an alternative school? Are they recommended by the school? Can the parent put, put the child in there, or are they are they forced to do it because of behavioral issues? How, how does that whole dynamic work? It's typically a referral from the public school. Yeah, the parents can advocate for that. Um, they do sometimes reach out to us, and we give them information, but let them know this is a decision that has to come from your public school. So we're happy to give you information, but um, parents ultimately have to advocate for that if the, if the school is not making that choice independently, which many schools do based on the needs of the kids. Okay. Is it, is it usually behavioral? Typically, but there's always, uh, always an underlying uh, mental health diagnosis and mental health concern, behavior. A lot of the kids that we work with in that setting have some kind of trauma or complex okay. trauma in their background, Okay, even though that's not a diagnosis, but still definitely prevalent in the population. That we serve. And, and, and can, can the school force someone to go into alternative if, if the school wants them to, but the parent doesn't? Just, I mean, it does get there once in a while. I think you go to, I think you, and I'm not a special ed expert, but I think you go into due process at that point okay. where, where, okay. where the school and the parent agree on what, disagree on what's the appropriate place. Uh, all right. Yeah. And so they, they go to due process and yeah. hammer it up. But and there are times when we will try to sort of listen to the parent in the school and say, what are your concerns with the program and, and see if we can allay some of the concerns. Okay. Um, but that doesn't always work. So sometimes it all gets right. a little farther. Thank you. System. We do a lot of tours. We, Kids are going to be successful if if their parents are comfortable with the placement. You know, if the parents don't want the placement, no matter how great our work is, they're going to go home yeah. and it could get undone. <laughs> so yeah. we really work hard to make sure the kids and the, the parents are feeling it. really yeah. good about the services that we provide at our school. Okay. One more question. I'm I'm still trying to wrap my head a little bit around the success beyond six because we've heard about it at different times. So if you can go back to that for a second, you said eighty percent of the schools in your catchment area are making referrals to you. Yes. So 20% are not, but schools have to still provide these services. So they are having to hire their own. And my understanding is that you can, as a counselor, you can make a lot more money if you're privately employed than if you are with a designated agency. Do we have an idea of approximately what the disparity is between like salary and income range. I mean, I mean, cause it's very frustrating because you know, you can draw down all these federal dollars where you're not getting it. You know, anecdotally, when, when we have a school-based clinician that's left our agency for private practice, I, I think it depends happens. on exactly yeah. what what their what their what their deal is. Sometimes they they could go for to another entity. We've lost counselors to like the hospital systems, and I think the pay disparity there tends to be relatively large. Um, but they a lot are going into private practice. I think on the on the backside of COVID, 
it made the ability to do that kind of service through telehealth a lot more um, accessible. And we've lost a good chunk of folks to, to go in and do that. So I'm not exactly sure what the numbers are, but I, I think it's it can be significant, although there's hurdles to overcome when you go into that kind of private practice of building a caseload. And if, if you're doing it on your own, there's insurance concerns, there's a whole bunch of things that people find that they didn't necessarily consider. But some there are some companies that kind of will basically hire you as a contractor and they take care of some of that. So I do think it, it's it's relatively significant, although in the last couple of years, we've made a big push to um, get our school-based clinicians' salaries much more in line with what they might find in the private sector. Have you had instances where you have lost individuals who then have just gone into private practice and stayed in the schools doing the same thing? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've had that happen in the schools and in primary care physician offices. So we've had private folks leaving our industry to go into private practice has always been a concern, but it's just amplified to Matt's point with telehealth. It's been easier to maintain some of those supports within their environment. So we actually have a number of people right now who have received their licensure from us. We provide supervised licensure um, as a benefit. They'll become licensed and then they'll move into private practice. And we've had two recently primary care physician offices that (laughs) coordinated and blueprint um, partners. Um, They are going it themselves because they can actually pay a higher rate. So um, licensed individuals is another one of the areas that we struggle to keep people and part of it is exactly what you're saying. So I do know just even in the current school year that we're in about 7% of the folks that have left licensed people and they are going into private practice or um, tomorrow Maples is mm-hmm. when it comes to one for me, which is our local pediatrician's uh, office. Pediatrician's office mm-hmm. right across the parking lot. So I think that's very, very real. And we do, we provide the internship then we provide supervision. Um, right. They get licensed and then the positive is that they have an understanding of our system and they work collaboratively with us. We That's our hope, right? Is that right. we're still right. we're expanding the system of care in some ways, but we'd like to keep the value. Right. It's like we're not, they're not going out of state, right? right? So they're at least still serving Vermonters, right. but it would, yeah. Go ahead and then um, you had, you mentioned Blueprint. Mm-hmm. Are you providing counselors to the, to the CHT teams? Yeah. Yeah, so we have actually, we just started our first community health um, worker with the same um, office. It's been very interesting that we have a really collaborative um, community and Blueprint is very um, well versed, well rounded. We, we do the work very well together. Apparently, I wanted to say well a few times. <laughs> Um, the, the issue is that when we look at hiring folks who want to work um, in the primary care physician's office, um, there might be some opportunities for them to be paid at a higher rate. So that primary care physician's office, using the same level of blueprint funding, is offering them a salary higher than what we can because we have things like administrative um, fees and costs associated with our benefits packages and things that are not coming up for that provider at the onset of hire. It, they eventually see it, they eventually uncover it. And so we're working really hard with our blueprint coordinator to help uncover those things first so that we can align more appropriately. But our community health team, we're tiptoeing into that right now. Um, and we have one provider that's that's very interested in it. So we're hoping to expand that. I'll say when, when we do lose people to private practice, we usually we can't compete with the salary, but where we try to feel like we can compete is, you know, you want a holiday, you can get paid. You get paid time off, you get vacation. Health insurance, we cover um, a portion of their health insurance. We cover, we do their billing. We provide their electronic medical record for documentation. So we do um, try to kind of bolster or talk about, this is the value of working as part of an agency is, you just provide care, do your note, and then you get a paycheck. If you do private practice, you have to kind of carry all of those other things yourself. But a lot of people um, don't, you know, again, it's people just see their paycheck. How big is my paycheck? And so they don't necessarily see the fact that the agency is covering their health insurance costs by $10,000 or whatever. Yeah. 
works. Until they get on right. it. Yeah. And then they know what the, the benefits are, yeah. Melanie, and then we can move on. Um, from a student and family's perspective, is there, um, how do the services that are, you're able to provide under a DA um, umbrella of supervision versus private practice, is there any difference between what's provided for the children based I, on that? I, go ahead. I, we're going to say the same thing. I absolutely. So. I, too. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think that's one of the biggest benefits of being served um, by someone in a DA is that you're connected to, you know, whether you come in through outpatient site, uh, therapy or you come through a school program or home and community based care. We're all aligned and approaching at the same time. We also have psychiatry access to psychiatry services. One of the things uh Tiptoeing a little bit around what Matt said earlier about part of our redesign as an agency is to really look at how we do support children who are going to school during the day and then going home to a home environment and how do we transfer those skills home with them. So how do we really wrap around kids in a way that um, if you are seeing a private therapist outside, those those pieces aren't connected and those, those that continuity of care isn't aligned. So. We absolutely see the benefit of that. And I, I think our school partners, as an example, um, have really been able to highlight that with families as well. Right. Private therapists to think of like traditional mental health treatment. They do outpatient therapy, psychiatry. Um, <coughs> they do, they can't do the rest. And when you look at the stats, that's only about 8% of what we do. So that is an important 8%. But it's everything else that we bring to help also like kids transition to adulthood, housing, you know, employment, um, maybe family mediation, those kind of home and community-based supports. Um, I think elevate the quality of what that treatment will be so that person will actually get better versus if they just have a, a 50 minute hour once a week. So we bring that kind of more broad perspective, which is more effective. And I would also say from, a, if you look at it from the, uh, the behavior intervention team's yeah. lens, um, schools, I think we've worked hard with them. And sometimes in their heads, they kind of equate uh, a BI and a paraeducator. And they sort of say, that's the same thing, but yours is a lot more expensive. And we try to uh, sort of emphasize that the BI is a lot more trained, first of all. But, you know, in our program, at least the BI, their case is overseen by a consultant who is either a board certified behavior analyst or in training the team leader who oversees the program is a board certified behavior analyst. The program manager is one. And so am I as the children's director. Mm -hmm. So there's levels of experience and expertise along with connection to um, some of Linda's folks in the community mental health side of things that helps make that service a lot more rich than mm -hmm. what they might be able to. And that's not to in any way downtrodden the support mm -hmm. schools provide, um, but it does tend to be a different level of support. <laughs> All right, one last question, then we'll move well, this on. Is really quick. I didn't hear if you said 8% or 80%. Eight. 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 That, that's what was like, whoa, that's eight, a huge. 8% yeah. of what we do is your traditional outpatient therapy, okay. psychiatry. The other 92% is uh, really everything else on this list other than adult and child outpatient. Everything, that's 8%. Everything else is the other 82%. Thank you. That, that's huge. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just kind of maybe putting a bow on this slide. Um, one area I want to highlight that makes us unique is um, we are a parent child center, which is, it's a group. I think it is a grouping of programs that's really designed to be upstream, to be proactive, identify people at risk and intervene <laughs> before they need more higher end services down the road. It's really birth to six ish home and community based. Um, there's a, a lot of population health, a lot of things in those that series of program that helps to make our community more resilient. Um, so I wanted to be sure to highlight that as well. And we've got a slide uh, later on, we can talk about that a little bit more if we get to it. But we are a parent-child center, which does make us a little bit unique within the DA system. Mm -hmm. um, and we're the only DA that has a parent-child center and that uh, is part of the agency. Okay. That's, That's cool. cool. Yeah. And you are going to talk about it later because I have questions. Well, on well, we can do those now. Yeah. Well, I, I wonder how you measure success in that. How do you how do you how do you measure what whether what you've done with the parent or the child has any any fears any truth? Well, we on this. Um, we definitely look at our numbers and we look at um, making sure. We think of access as one of our success points. Make sure people have access to care. So we really track. We have targets and we really try and put our structure in place to make sure our staff are able to go out and 
find those people, to help those people that need the care, make sure that people in the community know where we are, are able to come in and access our services for supports. Um, that's and, one and I'm aspect. not asking because I don't think it's a good mm. thing. I just wonder, you know, are you seeing the same folks come back and back and they're just not seeing it or they're just not improving? I, I, I'm trying to get a sense of what it does. Well, the Parent Child Center specifically is they're usually prenatal to up until the day before their sixth birthday for is kind of where the edge of those programs run. Um, and, and there's a lot of different that I've, I came out of the school-based world and I'm kind of over the parent child center now. So I'm really trying to catch up and do my homework on everything up to speed because they do a lot of work. It's a lot of different programs. It tends to be a lot of different um, grant funding that goes into um, the services they provide. But all of the grants have specific sets of outcomes, which I have a couple in front of me. It's just, you know, 100% of children enrolled in parents as teachers have attended a well-child visit with their pediatrician. That was FY22. Um, 100% of the 19 to 35 month olds report up-to-date immunization. So some are very, very concrete like that, but some are, um, you know, uh, X amount of diapers distributed to so many families across the region. The, 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 it's from very um, specific to, to are we providing people to access to concrete supports to some of them actually provide um, in-home um, mental health treatment and mental health care for families uh, with very young children. So um, the outcomes can be, um, it's a pretty broad spectrum of what those outcomes would might, might be, but those are all indicative of whether we're making progress or not. And I think one of the things that makes that program, that program unique and the agency unique for having the parent child center in there is that if we feel like that family and those kids need ongoing support, that's a conversation down the hallway, you know, or with your next door neighbor or the person who you sit in meetings on versus um, a referral from one agency to the other, which and that's not to knock the system anywhere else in the state, but it is something that makes it unique in terms of providing a cohesive, you know, treatment experience. Okay. You know, I, I will say, I, I really appreciate your question. Uh, results based accountability, RBA. That's something we are really trying to grab onto. We tend to live in how much did you do? How many people did you serve? How many hours of care did you provide? That tends to be where we live. And in part, that's because what, that's what our grants require us to track. They require us to report that out. But we really want to work with our state partners to start to shift to say, you know, out of those 100 people you serve, how many of them are better off? And so that's, so, so that's what we really are trying. And I think our entire healthcare system is shifting that way. And that is a good thing. We definitely want to be part of that and work with you all, work with our, our agency human services partners to, to move in that direction. Well, I would hope the things you have up here, you're not doing just to do them. You're right. doing them to make a difference. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I mean, <laughs> it's hard to measure. I know. I mean, a lot of us, you know, how do you measure it? Yeah, we, I mean, we do have some good stories. Like I think about TMS, it's so just an example that's up there. We did the legislative breakfast where we had some folks come and do some really good stories. Um, one reminds me of a child with autism mm -hmm. and success. Uh, a young man who was actually working, holding jobs with our supports. Like, I think there's some stories. I think those are suspicious things as far as right. hard, hard to track. Track. Yeah, it's hard to track because you do need to track what a funder, for example, says how many, what is the best right, quality right. versus quantity. Yeah, I think it's important. So you kind of need both. Yeah, there's data and then there's, there's the. the the stories that tell you the impact has been topic. Um, and on, on your list of Vermonters served, uh, you have developmental services. C can you just explain that, what that is? So, yeah. Yeah, what do you do? So, so developmental services, it's um, through the Department of Aging and Independent Li Living, we are charged with serving people with intellectual disabilities. And I want to say it's about 250, 250 people that we serve in our community. Um, we offer, it's a variety, it's a continuum of care for people. The thing I love about this program, and it's also one of the things that is the hardest to track, is every single person's treatment plan is different from the next person's. So um, like I, one of the questions you said is, what's your rate for developmental services? And they're all different because this person might just need a little bit of support in the community a couple times a week. And then we might have another person and they need 24-7 staffing, sometimes two-on-one staffing 
to support them in a residential setting. Do you and, do that? Yeah, you know, we do that. And how many residential settings do you have? Okay, how many ten. people we use? Ten, we have yeah. ten residential sites. Serving roughly 100, um, year to date, well, last year we did 148 people receive services within one of our residential programs. And that's all inclusive. So that includes our DS population, our um, mental health population. Those would be the two primary yeah. ones. Yeah. It's, I, I, I might be a good time to talk about the, the need for residents in general. We definitely, um, as our population, I think, is aging, we're seeing a type of person, actually, I'll use the example you showed me just the other day. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, a, a, an, an older Vermonter living in one of our residential programs with a severe and persistent mental illness. That house has two levels. And so she has to actually go upstairs to her bedroom and come back downstairs. She will be completely unable to live on her own in the community. She needs 24 seven care. And so one of the things we're doing is we're trying to be forward thinking. And we know we have a number of, we've actually counted, we have people that require single level. I think of my parents, you know, my parents, yeah. you know, they, they, my parents need single level. They moved into a new home because it's one level. And it's the same thing that we preserve. So we're actually in the process of working with both Dale and DMH to build two programs, one to target older Vermonters with intellectual disabilities, and the other one to focus on older Vermonters with severe and persistent mental illness that is uniquely built, designed for an older population. Mm -hmm. Single level, bathroom, kitchen, no steps. Um, when, when are you going to do, when, when is that, the work you're doing now? So we have um, purchased the house for the intellectual disability program. And we actually just had a meeting last week to, to break ground and well, we're you gonna- one of, Excuse me for interrupting. Yeah. Are you one of the pilot projects? We are not. You're not. You're doing this on your own. We're doing this on our own. Wonderful. Um, we feel like we have enough resources to get the ball rolling. And then our hope is, again, we've already identified mm -hmm. people that need this program that we're already serving that I think we're serving them in a place that puts them at risk. We yeah. want to move those people into these homes. That's right. So we're not part of the part pilot. We're doing that now. That's good. I'm glad you did. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Now I'm forgetting. Oh, so it's my understanding that you are one of the designated agencies that does not provide substance use disorder treatment. Am I correct? We are the designated agency, um, the preferred provider for adolescent substance use. Okay. So we do kids. The Howard Centers in our community, they provide services for adults and we partner with them on that. They do it well. We feel like that relationship is working well. That partnership goes well. Um, and so we just work together on that. Is there a lot of correlation between the population that you're serving? Do you work collaboratively with that individual on these? Yes, we do. Yeah, I, I would say that although we're not the preferred provider for adults receiving substance use services, we do provide co-occurring work for adults who have mental health and uh, substance use disorder. So we do serve um, that population. And when Howard Center is serving individuals that we might be um, also serving in our CRT program, our Community mm -hmm. Rehabilitation and Treatment Program, we do a high level um, collaboration. We also have, I just, um, we're in the process of switching this a little bit because of some leadership changes that they have, but we do a monthly, just a leadership conversation about how's it going? What's our collaboration look like? We include the emergency department um, in that conversation as well. Because I think, you know, they're our capital O, Todd says this, our um, individuals that we're serving. And so as a community, I think we do that really well. I think we really partner in a way that's effective and um, people appreciate it. This is a dumb question, I know. <laughs> but Topper just, when you were talking about this person at this residence that will need, do people pay rent when they're in residence? They do. They, they, they pay a percentage of um, their... Um, subsidy to us. Um, okay. She, this, this individual um, is, uh, her funding profile is a little bit different. So this, the department does uh, fund her room and board, but yeah. And I just want to say um, it goes without saying that we are all talking about um, 
elder population and you know where do nursing homes come in where do those those kind of residences and and folks with mental illness or folks with developmental disabilities are usually not allowed to are not invited may, maybe not invited to access those programs because of their extended needs that's why we're looking at building those programs Okay, so I'm going to allow Leslie and Alan, and then we really need to make sure we hear the rest of the presentation. <laughs> so we had this last week or the week before, and you're the only one, like you said, um, the only DA that has a parent-child center. And that's always worried me. I come from the South, there's parent-child center in Springfield, there's HCRS, and I feel like they're siloed, and I worry about that. So how did it happen that you integrated these things? This because was, it's very cool. This was before my time, you know, 1999. So this was um, the um, Franklin County. Uh, okay. And they were really struggling um, to um, financially just maintain their agency. And so the state actually approached us and said, can you intervene? Can you step in and um, take them over, basically merge with them is how I think of it, and um, work with them to provide those services. And then you get an economy of scale throughout the larger agency, which should decrease costs a little bit. And so that's what we did back in 1999. Yeah. I mean, and the integration of families in your, it just seems so much brighter. I think it works really well. And then we actually added the Franklin County one joined as well mm -hmm. later on. So we're actually technically where we were, were two parent child centers. Um, and we cover those, that scope of services. And I, I always say, um, I think that makes us better as a designated agency because it, causes us to be thinking preventatively, mm -hmm. proactively from a population health point of view. And that kind of, that culture, it gets woven into all of our services. And I think that makes our agency a little bit stronger. That was my, that. that sounds like yeah. I was hoping for. Mm -hmm. so, thank you. Yeah, but Parent Child Health Center, they have a little bit different focus and a little bit way, different way they go about their work. And I think um, that's one of the things that the directors have always done well on is sort of maintaining that culture of the parent-child center within sort of the greater flow. That was actually, Amy was the PCC director <laughs> at NCSS before she was in this position. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, Thank you. And did that admirably. Get back to the residential services, you say some pay. Do some have the ability to pay on their own? Is it Medicaid? Is it uh, Social Security? Is it private insurances or all? Oh, oh. I did. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking at it. Depends. Yeah. Okay. It depends on their. It does. Okay. Yeah. I'm just curious about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so can we, we'll linger on this one for a second. So, just a couple of things to highlight on the number served. So, you'll see the agency unduplicated. Um, you know, that's, that is the total number of people that we serve. The next line down is agency total, and that's um, served by, by uh, services. So the example I use, the concrete example of why those numbers are different is if we serve someone, an individual that it has a severe and persistent mental illness and we serve them in a, in, um, a community-based setting mm -hmm. and they concurrently are accessing a therapist, that person would count twice on the second line because they're accessing two yeah. services. Yeah. So we included that, but the top sir, top line, we only would count them once. So that's why those two numbers are a little bit different. Um, and then we talked about school partnerships quite a bit. Um, if you go down about halfway and you can see our pre COVID numbers, we were six, 630 students served, 679, 643. And then you can see during COVID um, those numbers really tailed off. And that's in part because, um, Schools had their own, they got all this COVID money right. and they were providing services on their own. They didn't really need a partnership quite as much. But now that that COVID money is drying up, we see we have an opportunity to really step in and work with schools to really help some kids and draw down some federal dollars to offset special ed costs. So we hope to see the fiscal year 24 and 25, that number continue to creep up. Right. Um, and then the residential you know, down there, we talked about a little bit as well. Um, and you can see where we added a new program in fiscal year 21. So those numbers jumped up. And then again, we hope to, um, in fiscal year 25, open the program for people with intellectual disabilities. And then after that, we're going to focus on the program for residential for adults with severe and persistence mental illness. They'll both be five, six beds. So do you have grants that you're using to, to 
to do these two residential? For those, what we're doing with those is we're <laughs> we're we're using our own agency resources to buy and renovate the buildings. So we're going to put in our dollars. We're going to invest in those. That's something our actually our board talks about this. How do we invest our limited resources in a way that helps people, honors our mission, but makes our community stronger? And so we see these two things as something that's really important for us to do. So we are tipping into our capital dollars, our capital plan, and using agency resources. <laughs> and then we'll work with our state partners to develop a rate to have those then paid for as, um, as residents move in. So that's kind of how we hope to do it. Right. So we're doing it up front, and then we hope to kind of have it sustained through the state. I should note, too, in terms of the numbers served at the Parent Child Center, yeah. uh, the numbers that are on here are, are the, is what we could pull out of our electronic medical record. But that's a lot less than what the actual number served is, particularly in FY19 and 20. Those, those are, those are a lot of, in FY21, uh, we, we took over the, the Chittenden County um, CCI yeah. program, yeah. which is why those numbers bump. But I think, for example, I think FY23 is somewhere just south of 1,000 people that were served in the Parent-Child Center. So those numbers are a lot more. Um, it just is kind of the difference in those two cultures of, you know, some of the stuff is not does not end up in our medical record instructor. Right. Yeah. That's why those those numbers are a little bit funky. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. And I just wanted to call it, I apologize. No, go ahead. Keep, go ahead. I just wanted to call attention to one other um, number here. When we're looking at the adult mental health CRT, I think there's been some conversation across the state around our DA serving those with the most severe and persistent mental illness. And you can see in our numbers that that continues to increase and, and it's a strong presence that we have with individuals being served. So I just want to call Yes, that. no, that's great. Thank you. I think that's maybe the first one we've seen actually go up. Go ahead, Leslie. Just a question about the Parent Child Center for 24. That's only half a year, a third of a year? That's through, I think, the end of February, we counted. So that's your date? Year to date. Through February, that's only two months. Fiscal year. Fiscal, Fiscal year. year. Sorry. This year is yeah, July 1st. Oh, Thank you. Great. All right. So jump to demographics. This, uh, just a couple of things to point out on this. One is on the, on the right side, you'll see that um, birth to 18 is 54.9% of the people we do are birth to 18. And again, I do really feel like that's because our parent child center. Yeah. Um, and my guess is if you had a pie chart for all the other VAs, <laughs> ours would a younger child services would be more significant than most because we're just built a little differently. Um, and then uh, we, we dug into diagnostic. I thought you might just find it a little bit interesting diagnostic who we serving. And we're seeing um, in kids, anxiety is the number one diagnosis by, by a lot. Um, we are definitely working with kids with families on that. We actually just recently held a community forum at Fairfield, Fairfield. Fairfield. Fairfield school and uh, with our psychiatrist went and met with a whole bunch of parents to talk about social media use Ooh. and the impact that that has on kids and strategies that parents can use to maybe protect their kids a little bit. So, and that, so I think there were 25 families in the, in the room. That's not going to show up on any of our stats, but it is something that we feel is really important and adds value to the community, makes it stronger. So anxiety in kids and depression is number one in adults by, by a lot. So anxiety kids, Depression, adults, those are the two things that we're seeing more of. My guess is that's consistent with other DAs. Yeah. It would surprise me if it's not, but it's those top two are definitely yeah. prevalent. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. I was just reading, reading a New York Times article today or yesterday, I forget when, about how parents mm -hmm. are anxious about whether their kids are anxious and they are making their kids more anxious. I'm like, oh my gosh, we're in like this vicious circle. So do you see that? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. She's I talking mean, about her own. I mean, I'm <laughs> 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 Like, oh my gosh, what am I asking my son? Like, I gotta start yeah. <laughs> that's true. I think we're seeing it all the time. And I, I think that's why Matt and I are really excited to be able to partner differently from, um, you know, when I think about a birth to maybe 17, 18 year old programming and then moving into transition age youth and adulthood. Like, we have an impact in both areas. And the hope is that we're working with parents who are anxious and we're helping them support, you know, changes in that, but we're absolutely seeing it. We're also, we've all just been through a pandemic. Right. We're all showing up to work with some of that, Still, you know, managing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Whether we realize it or not. Yeah, that's right. Uh, before Art, did you have a question before you move? Are you good? No, I got it wrong. Okay, so we apologize. He has to go. Good luck, Topper. Art. Yeah. yeah um, with that parent child and the zero eighteen, again, my question is who who sends the families to you? Do they self refer? Do they get referred by the school? How do they get involved? <laughs> do they think they need it and go to you? How, how does and and, uh, and this is the other question I always have with this. We seem to be Medicaid based. Can non-Medicaid people come and use services? I think the referrals, the school-based programs are referrals from the school yeah. and parent support. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the outside of the school-based programming, families can call and access resources. Um, we get some referrals from DCF. Um, there's a, a number of those referral sources, but I think families calling and looking for services. If they want pediatricians and doctor's offices do a lot of referring. Okay. So that can come from a lot of places. Um, in terms of private, insur private insurance, I think we're limited some by what private insurances will pay for. I think um, most of the private insurance kids that we serve are probably on the outpatient teams because that's kind of what private insurers say is that's the recognized model. That's what we'll pay for. Um, but in terms of things like home and community support, some of the, some of the more creative programs, Programming that we do, private insurers just don't cover that. Yeah. So that's that it's not so. No. So, so just so I'm very clear on what we're talking about here. So your services are Medicaid services. Primarily. Thank you. All right. I also just wanted to highlight that one of the places we get caught a bit is because families do self-refer and they talk to their neighbors and their sibling or their cousins and their friends or whatever. And so they are also a huge referral source for us. Where it gets a little bit sticky is that one family might have private insurance and one family has Medicaid and they're not technically eligible for the same service within our funding structure. And so when you think about wanting to be community-based and, and wanting to meet the needs of our community, it can be really hard to do that given our funding structures. Okay. Leslie, did you have a question? No. Okay. We'll jump to the agency success. One we talked about these quite a bit, just kind of in other conversations. Thanks. Can I ask a question first on your partnerships? Yeah. Do you have, so I see St. Albans City Police. So you're, do you have a person added to people? You do not have a state. No, you do have a state parks. So do you have? Yeah, we have two in the city and one in the state. Yep. Okay, great. All right, thank you. We were one of the first, I think, I think, um, Brattleboro was the first to develop this model. And then we were right on their heels, jumped right in. And we provide, we embedded a clinician in the state police barracks on our dime. Something I think our agency does really well. We're, I, I like to think we're super innovative and we're willing to take risks if we think it works. And so we embedded a clinician and we funded that ourselves for a couple of years, <coughs> tracked the data, showed the outcome. And, um, and then it kind of, it, it, it caught on yeah. um, statewide and they actually used our job description as the model for the, the job description statewide. Okay. So that's something we've been doing mm -hmm. for, for a while. Yeah. Leslie? So I'm thinking about partnerships and this is a little off pace, so say, forget it. Um, <laughs> but we did hear from visiting nurses that they had to take over Franklin County from Rutland area because of the problems. And I'm just wondering, is there any overlap with, do you have with other of those kinds of agencies using nurses who are struggling and does that affect you? We you um, may not have to affect you at all. Child Center. The, the parent child center does some contracting with the visiting nurses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, uh, so, some of the services that we, the nursing supports and the intensive nursing supports, we subcontract through them to provide those services. So there is some, mm -hmm. I don't think it's a, it's not a huge amount. Mm -hmm. um, that's, it's going to be interesting to see how that goes over the next couple of months as that entity comes in and sort of takes over operations in our region mm -hmm. um, and how those, that exactly gets laid out. Yeah. So there is some, it's not, it's not a huge amount of kids, but there is some. We are reaching out to them to ensure that transition goes smoothly. Yeah, because I'm thinking there are adults that get discharged with medical problems, but also probably work with your agency. Absolutely. Yeah. What's the intersection there? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't spend a lot of time. Yeah, yeah no, I, I mean, it absolutely is the case. I was just sitting here thinking I don't even have. I don't have a number to throw out at all, but I do know when we're talking case consultation for adults, specifically those served by CRT, absolutely. We have overlap with BNA mm -hmm. and we will, as we continue to increase our reach into the elder population yeah, yeah. service. Yeah. Thank you. I think in, um, the primary care office is on this. We know actually, Glenn and I talked about this the other day as well, that um, 
most people that die by suicide will have seen their primary care provider um, prior within 30 days, 60 days prior to that attempt. And so we want to be there. We want to be present. We want to have really strong relationships with our primary care docs um, so that referral can happen. So we can pick up on that at that moment, make that referral. We can wrap those people up to, to mitigate that risk. Um, so that is why we, I feel we have very strong relationships with our primary care offices. And just as an example, like I know I mentioned Blueprint can be a little bit tricky sometimes, but we do have a relationship with a primary care office right now who um, previously had a hard time referring to us. They were saying that, you know, our referrals were long waits and such. So we actually embedded a clinician in their office just to do intakes. So they're there one day a week meeting um, folks who are in there for appointments, they do the intake right there in an office that they feel comfortable with, with their provider, and then they'll come and seek services continuously through our office. And we, we're hoping that that will take, take off a little bit so that people are continuing to feel just comfortable in their environment. Yes, definitely. Yeah, that's great. Okay. The agency successes and then... <laughs> challenges. And then we have a slide on workforce as well that, that we thought was very interesting when we kind of pulled that as well. We'll, we'll, we'll be sure to hit too. Um, some of the successes, and we've talked about them a lot. I, I really feel like our agency, um, we, we, uh, we partner, we collaborate with people in the community. I think we have something kind of special in Franklin Grand Isle counties that our community, we don't have a lot of turfy issues. Um, it's not a lot of competition. Like we're all kind of one up each other or anything. We really do come together. Like even the eclipse, you know, we set up an incident command in partnership with our local hospital yesterday and we worked really well with them. Um, the VNA was part of that as well. Um, and, and the notch, uh, our FQHC was part of that. And we came together just to kind of rally resources. We had all each other's contact information. Should something go wrong, we can call them up and we can rally our, our larger team of, healthcare providers to whatever, every, whatever got thrown at us. And I will say it did I was it really it well. well. Yeah, we were, yeah, it was, the yeah, phone good. didn't ring. That's right. The phone didn't ring. That's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Andy drove down here and that was, I packed a, a night, an overnight bag thinking, uh, would I be able to get home? Yeah. Oh, you were kind of, so I could, I could wear a tie for you. Right. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it went everything went well. But the community collaboration, I think that is what our community does really well. Um, and when you ask our state partner or our local partners, I think they would say the same thing. So that feels really good. Um, one thing we want to talk about is our unified electronic medical record. I think, okay, why, why is that on our success list? Um, I do think there's a perception sometimes that the DAs are a bunch of individual standalone with no integration, no coordination. And our unified um, electronic <laughs> medical record, we actually have four of us have come together. We've got Lamoille, Washington County, Bennington, and us. We've come together to purchase the same platform. So there's an economy of scale to be had by all being on one electronic medical record. And then part of the beauty of that is we have the same system. So that has now lent itself to, um, if you wanna to speak to some of the, the billing structures that we have, well, we, we'll go ahead. Oh, yeah, sure. So we try to focus on our workflows all being the same. Um, the example I just mentioned was billing. Lamoille had some staff turnover. They had some new staff that were very green. We were able to have them come to our agency. Mm -hmm. Our two billing teams together was in each other's systems, training them, teaching them, and working right in their systems. That's to great. Show them how to do the billing. So there's a real economy of scale, even beyond the services, that our, our administrative infrastructure, we're interwoven that I think we build on each other and there's an efficiency to be had in that, that we're always looking to grab. And um, this one in particular, Washington County, Lamoille and Bennington, we just came together on this project and it's, um, it's, going, it's going well. How do you talk to each other? I mean, do you as CSU all or, or HR or whatever your position is, I mean, how do you communicate and how does... For our EMR, we've got a small core group of people, there's five, um, that we all share the expense, but they build the system in our root system code. So we build it all the same. So they build it once in the four, but there might be one program that one agency has that we all agree on how it's gonna be built in case someone else down the road has that program turned on, it's already built. Okay. So that's one benefit. 
We do have a lot of Zoom meetings during the week. We try to be really mindful of everybody's time. So we've got a core working group, um, a person from each agency that talks about what each agency needs, compromise, and then we have quarterly meetings to what's coming down from the state, what's next that we have to consider and prepare for. And do it all together. And is that just amongst those of you that have the unified electronic medical record or is it all of the DAs? So this particular one I'm talking about is just for the four with the EMR, but collectively okay. as yeah. a state, we do have all the compliance officers come together once a month, all the yeah. HR directors. So okay. there is definitely a tight network. We can call each other up and ask for help about anything. That's overseen by Vermont Care Partners. They're yeah. the ones that hold yeah. all that together. My my group comes together twice a month, you know, the, the mm -hmm. adult um, mental health folks, HR directors. Yeah. Okay. Uh, once a month. Great. Yeah. Once a month. Okay. That's great. Uh, Leslie and then Art. Yeah. I'm just curious about why only four out of the 14 came together. For, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So, but, in 2016, uh, our seven of us were on the same EMR, but they look completely different because we built them all differently and by ourselves. Company was bought out, so all 10 agencies came together and said, let's look what's out there to see if we can do this together. Half went with one vendor and four went with the other. Clara Martin was already on it, so there's five and five of each vendor. Okay. So it's kind of what we aligned uh, documentation and workflows amongst the 10 that when we did the build, it was similar. So you communicate if you have, I would imagine people move around the state. Oh, yeah. So that you're Mine is very small. Yeah, yeah it's not very small. So that works. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. And for our EMR, we trained all four agencies together. So it may have been an NCSS trainer, but we had staff from all four agencies in the Zoom for the training. And that was certainly part of the discussion at that point is, you know, if somebody lives in Barrie and moves to St. Albans, the whole process should not feel completely foreign to them. It's still, we should feel like a system yeah. to the people that we serve. Could you imagine keeping it this way? Or do you feel like there needs to be more, even more of that? Or are you pretty, it's pretty settled at this moment. We, we built it in a way that we can bring on new people. So we tried to build it in a way that's scalable. Uh, we built it for the four of us. But as anybody needs, they can come on. Um, so, and we did that on purpose because we think there's an economy of scale to be had. That we're always trying to look to leverage what we can. And Clara Martin was on this electronic medical record before we were. So they were part of our meeting. So it was definitely the five of us working together. It still seems pretty and stable. So was, everyone's pretty content with the system. I think so. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Thank you. Yes, this might be a defining moment. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, no. I oh, understand going to be a <laughs> because I am constantly amazed that that the whole setup. Because this is what I want to know, I guess, to start with. Uh, there are certain um, certain things you do that are common to every DA. If you in the state, the is, is that That's the cool. kind of a common thing? Because I, I, yes. I've been four years here. I keep hearing about DAs, and, and, and I understand some of what you do, but I, it, it always blows my mind that everyone's not marching to the same drum. Mm -hmm. I, it, 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 I, I don't get that. And, and I'm just trying to understand what is the core of the DAs that, that you must do? Or is there? That's this. That's that, that correct. That, that the, that does is all the, of them do that? All of us yes. do those. And all that's, con them. that's a contract with a Agency of Human Services. They each have a contract with okay. AHS to do those things. To do those On things. The and they're private companies that do it? Yes. So you're a private outfit. Well, not yeah, they're not a state agency is another way. So they are not a state they're agency. Not, right, correct. They're, okay, and all of them are like that, Lori? Okay, so they're all semi-private. Yeah, non-profit. Non non-profit. 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 Yeah. Non -profit. Okay, so you're a non-profit agency that has these core principles. You could probably add to it. Again. That's this list. Okay, yeah. and the, the tailor them to your area. Yes, mm -hmm. and and so that makes sense to me. Uh, and now we're talking about communication, which blows my mind. It wouldn't all be the same, but whatever. Yeah, me too. I'm with you. <laughs> okay, so thank the contract, you. Defining moment. The contract is done every year, correct? Every year. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the financial contract. I don't understand the nature of the contract after my four years here. What does that mean? Contract? 
It is a written document that they agree to as to what they are expected to do as part of a designated system of care. Well, and not financial and the con we, ha we have access to the contracts. Yeah. So it's what measures we're going to report on, what information we're going to share, what we're going to do, how we're going to do programming. So not a financial contract. Just financial, financial, financial and programmatic. Yep. Yes. So no, I, if I can explain it yeah. in a way that I explain it to all of my employees that have employed orientation every month. Great. Think about it this way. Think about it as in the state has designated us to provide those services oh, okay. on their behalf. On their behalf. So oh, okay. here, a provider agreement comes through and saying, we're going to pay you so much and these are the services that you're going to provide. And that's the only thing that we are contracted, if you will, by the state. So we're providing right. services on behalf of the state. But what about people that Medicaid? I mean, I know that you're billing Medic, you know, outside exactly. insurance, right? So I'm work. not sure how that fits together. For non-Medicaid? No, from the contract that you have with DMH, right. there's a, a financial exchange. Um, but for those who have Medicaid, or uh, that is the financial that is, that, yeah, that is. Financial. Well, what's confusing to me is it's really about med they're billing Medicaid. Yes. yes. You are billing Medicaid? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it is 7%. So we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't really look at it, or does it come through the yes. state? Yeah. So remember every year. So, so the contracts themselves, no, we do not look at those. That is AHS yeah, right. with each individual agency. When I say us, I mean the state. The state, yes. So AHS and each agency comes together and they have their contract each year okay. and rates are set and all that good financial yeah, stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the key thing that I want our, everyone who sits at these seats to remember is, as she said, it is a designated system of care that are nonprofit agencies that are not state employees, and therefore they do not get state benefits. They do not get an annual state pay increase, which is why we're constantly at this table talking about what are the reimbursements for Medicaid and do we need to increase the reimbursement rate? Okay, now does that, that's, but but the increase in reimbursement rates doesn't affect the salaries of the folks that work here. It's, it's yeah. a direct correlation. It, yeah. it does. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. It's income. Uh -huh. That's how we earn our money. Yes. The state oh, basically gives us permission okay. to bill Medicaid. See, that's where I'm saying. That's stuck. how I would think of it. Why okay. do you need permission from the state in order to bill Medicaid? Be that's right. what I think I can, I think I got this one. <laughs> <laughs> it is super, it is super confusing. Um, we don't need permission from the state to build traditional mental health services such as psychiatry and outpatient. We do need permission from the state to build that broader scope of service that we provide, such as residential care, home and communities, a BI in a school, those kind of things, not more, more non-traditional um, treatment type of options. So that's why people can leave our agency and be a private therapist and build Medicaid for and do 50 minute hours, do therapy, but they can't leave our agency and do a, create a residential program or be a home and community-based provider because you need permission from the state. Okay. Helpful. These are really good questions. Well, well it's it important we understand this dynamics. I thought I had that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So, so someone comes in for service, services of some kind, and we it, you bill Medicaid. So a portion of that goes to the salaries of the folks that provide the service. Is that correct? 80% of that. 80%? Yeah. 80% of our revenue goes okay, to because it's all, it's all, it's no material. It's all work. It's all labor. Okay. Well, all right. Got it, I think. What makes it that when you say the 80%? How many employees do you have in here? That's a good question. Uh, 510 right now. 510. How many openings do you need? Yeah, how many openings? Yeah, how many openings? Oh, wow. 597. We have 510 employees with 97 openings right now. We were just prior to COVID. Um, yeah. We were about 610, 615. Uh, took a nice nose nice dive down about 30, and now we slowly started to come back. Oh, that's and good. We're at about 510. That's great. Is that because of the increases that we were able to mm -hmm. all of that? If we want to go ahead to those workforce. Yeah, I was so yeah, right. And let's I want to make sure we hit 
the rest of the successes or challenges and then we'll get to the work for yeah you. okay there you go yeah this one i want to lose like the other stuff you want to talk about but yes how to answer any questions specifically but to answer that question directly does the awards i would say that you've done here absolutely help so one of them specifically right now is the loan repayment program which has been a huge we just on our round three super grateful that has gone um i've just hands down 98 percent retention rate of those employees great so anybody that participated and got money and agreed <clears throat> for the service obligation retain 98 percent of them um the other i guess the other things maybe to point out on there is that we really try to put money in folks' pockets. It's one of the mantras that we have all the time. Culture is big for us. And one of the things that we talk about is selling our culture. And part of that is selling, um, having our employees sell our culture. And so we reward employees to come and work for us by giving them a referral bonus. And that truly accounts for about 40% of our hires. Wow. Um, we pay $500 staff bonus, refer a friend. That's great. Is what we call it, refer a friend. Um, have been doing our own in-house career fair. So if you know anything about career fairs, go to school, we get all the colleges, we do all of them. The return on investment is pretty minimal if you're just looking straight up at sort of the um, quantity, right? How many did I hire from one there? But it's, again, the bigger picture, which is we're present, we're there, we're building relationships, we have partnerships, we do all of those things. Um, but doing our own in-house career fair has proven to be more valuable mm. in our area. So 30%, you know, 30% um, were acquired from our own in-house career fair. We're probably about six years into doing our own. What does that mean by your own in-house? Meaning that I popped up the sign out front and said on April 15th, we're doing an on-site career fair. Come in, set up tables, all of our team leaders, groups of our team leaders join. Talk about our programs, we have goodies, you get some things and we do it for about two hours. Uh, and so the way to kind of look at that is if you are interested in working at our agency, you'll come and make a face-to-face -face connection. It's not about the indeed application. The we get um about 2,000 applications a year, but we only hire about 100, 110 people probably on average per year. Uh, because it's, if anybody's hiring ever, you know the applications are just click, click, right. click, yeah. click. Um, so they're not quality applications, mm -hmm. but when you come, you take the time to come and see me and shake my hand and say hi to right. uh, our in-house career So that's been our second most valuable mm -hmm. um, recruiting and maybe innovative strategy. Yeah. Our turnover rate, we have prided ourselves in about a 15 to 16% turnover rate for many, many years. Uh, COVID Boom, we went right back up, as did the state. You can see, I, I included a graph in the bigger packet. You can just kind of see the state average and our average. And we tend to trail them historically. Uh, but we bumped up to about 23% with COVID. And that's coming back down. I can see it nicely coming down. We're down to 19.2. I suspect the next couple of years we'll see that hopefully sugar off. Anything between 15 and 17%, I'm super happy with because it's new ideas and innovation. Um, Maybe to the point about the dollars being directly connected, um, our BI program programs, our school based programs, and we talk about success, success beyond six specifically. 27% um, of those folks in our current fiscal year have been school based. The turnover has been in our school based programs. Uh, we have probably about 29 openings, 30 openings right now for BIs. Um, I know you can go on Howard Center website and you can see that they're hiring again there. A dollar more an hour, I think, than what hours start at. Um, it's just, it, it, they're hard jobs. You're talking about behaviors that um, these, these kids are maybe on their last leg, not even um, going to be successful without somebody. So it's a hard job to keep somebody in. Uh, a little bit of flexibility, very limited because you got to follow the school. Kids in school, right. you've got to be in school. So I think there's some challenges there, but it's also a great program. People leave for financial reasons. Mm -hmm. I actually think I included in um, some of the documents that I gave you current exit survey data right now. The respondents, 48% of them stated leaving for financial reasons. So I think there is a direct connection to um, dollars coming into the system and what we're able to do for our employees. Right. It keeps them. Uh -huh. And the retention programs have worked great. We've done stay bonuses and retention bonuses, which have all kind of trickled down. Funds and those have really high retention rates. The loan forgiveness that you all approve. Yeah. 
uh, loan forgiveness last year, maybe two years ago now. And that, and there's a, a, one of your yeah, boards up there. The 98%. Yeah. So that, those things work. They, they definitely work, they and, which makes a big difference. I think difference. a unique fact, um, and I, I added it up here just because I think this maybe just goes to the education, which I think is what we're here to point today. Um, nearly 650,000 miles are driven on yeah. personal cars. And when I say that's with clients, that is not the services. We're very community based. That's not. Um, accounting for the services that aren't happening when the client is not in the car. So that number there is just strictly me and my client. It didn't. It doesn't come out for me going yeah. to my client. It's just me and my client. When we're doing our services. What are we mm. going to do? Uh, an appointment or somehow meeting my plan yeah. of care. That's the personal. It also doesn't account for our agency vehicles, and we've got a fleet of thirty vehicles that are delivering services. Um, so I, I just think when you start to look at the numbers and yeah. the amount of people that are out in our community, the risk they're taking every single right. day, right. Um, being in the, car. On the road, the cost of that, the wear and tear. Do you, I was going to say, do you reimburse for mileage? We do. We mm -hmm. reimburse first for mileage, mm -hmm. which obviously is meant to do um, something, but it's not a lot of something, but yes. Yeah. Let's put it this way. When the cost of gas goes up, right. our yeah. reimbursement rate doesn't come up at the same right. time. Exactly. And you, you asked, and I thought your question about what percentage of that rate increase goes into staff's wage, and, and I said 80%. Part of the other 20% goes to things like that mileage. So that's where that uh, it goes to, like, plowing the driveway, you know, cutting the grass, fixing the roof, putting, yeah. paying the mileage checks. Um, those other kinds of things is where that other 20% goes. And it's super valuable. I mean, that you know, the, given the, the a lot of the population we serve, transportation is a big obstacle yeah. to accessing yeah. services and the ability to sort of meet them where they are or bring them onto a site or whatever we have to do to make sure they can access them is, is a really valuable piece of what we do. Um, well, my first question was about the mileage, but just to go on to that, uh, how far do you go for client services outside of Franklin County and Grand Island? Right. The vast majority are within Franklin and Grand Isle County, but we do have a few students attend SOAR from Lamoille County, from Chittenden County, and then we do have um, one of our, our larger parent-child center programs, our early intervention program, is actually stationed. That's a partnership with the Howard Center. I didn't mention that. Again, a partnership with them where we have expertise they have a funding mechanism. We partnered to put those two things together and we are stationed out of the Lund Family Center oh, in Chittenden okay. County to provide um, early childhood services to the people of Chittenden County in partnership with Howard. So that's a fairly large team and, and they're, they're outside of our catchment area. Yeah, that's somewhere in the ballpark of okay. three or four yeah, hundred kids a year probably. Wait, with that mileage, I was... Yeah. <laughs> Where's a But she pulled that. I, I, I knew it was a big number, but even that, that was eye popping to me. Yeah, that's a lot. It's just a <laughs> yeah. Reimbursement must be federal, though, right? No. It, it's not federally based? No. Is it federally set? No. no. Okay. It's what you can afford. Okay. Private. Oh, so it, I mean, you set it. We do set it. We okay. have done a really great job in the last few years, though, um, just trailing up. I'm trying to remember what's the We're 57 right cents and the feds are like 62 yeah. or something. Yeah. yeah, we're about five cents, I think. Oh. Roughly five to 10 cents. Each Higher? Lower. 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 I'm going to turn over here, I think. What was your total budget for this fiscal year? Um, it was our total revenue. I want to say it was 51, 52 in there somewhere. And we are developing next year's, and I think that'll be a couple million more, so maybe 54, 55, um, mostly because we anticipate more school partnerships. We think we can really help schools keep those special ed costs down by partnering with them, which allow us to build more federal Medicaid, which we'll see that reflected in our budget. Yes. With those schools, you actively go to them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, and they have many reasons why not. I don't, I don't understand that. I know why they might not partner. Well, we have a source program in, in Enosburg. You have a source program. And I, you know, I don't understand why they're not using your sources. So. I think there's a couple different reasons for that. Part of it is just simply um, the level of need right now in the, in the school population is, is, I would say, higher than I have ever seen it in my 
23 years doing this work at, in Franklin and Grand Isle County. Um, and so part of it was they felt like they needed to do that to sort of meet the needs of, of population because just the sheer numbers of kids that need some level of support um, were exceeding the capacities of the system for a while. We've started to swing back in the right direction. Um, and there's also, you know, and I applaud schools for doing some of this. You know, there's kids that um, might need kind of an in-house alternative program, but they might not necessarily need SOAR, <laughs> but there are kids that need SOAR. So I think schools along with us are, you know, part of our responsibility is to be good stewards of the financial resources that we have. Um, and so they're trying to sort of meet the needs of the kids that they have in their communities um, in the least intrusive way, which is, you know, special ed raw, they got to be in the least restrictive environment. So they're trying to meet those pieces in a way that they feel is cost effective for a chunk of those kids. Um, I think that's a lot of it. There's also, again, when you look back at the at Medicaid rates, you know, a lot of success beyond six funding is, or school based services are, are Medicaid funded. Um, so we can do things for kids with private insurance who don't have Medicaid. That tends to be costlier because there's no Medicaid reimbursement to offset that. So especially for some kids like that, schools look to build some of those programs again kind of for the same set of reasons. Sometimes I think when we our ability to draw down federal Medicaid and save schools money is a good thing, but there are strings attached to it. The feds put strings on on that. So it's not just free money. Right. You have to have a mental illness. You have to have a mental diagnosis. You have to have an income eligibility to, to be eligible for Medicaid. So um, there are certain kids that um, we would struggle to partner with because those strings would make it hard. So there are times when schools do develop things to get around those strings which is makes sense. Yeah. Great, thank you, it's really good information. Challenges or? Yeah, let me, I'll mention one other kind of collaborative thing that, that I, that we're really proud of the last few years is 988, you've heard a lot about 988 Lifeline. We're one of the agencies, in partnership with Northeast Kingdom, we're one of the agencies that uh, answers those calls. So anybody anywhere in the world, if you have an 802 area code and you make a phone call during the day, it will ring right in our, our office. And then in the evenings, it'll ring at the Northeast Kingdom's office. And we work really closely with them. Mm -hmm. And we set up kind of, again, the incident command structure yesterday thinking we were going to get this big flux. But I want to share the story. You yeah. shared a funny story with me about just an example uh, yeah. of a 988 call that happened yesterday. Right. So I think everybody was trying to be really prepared for crises, right? what could happen. And uh, I was meeting with one of our 988 callers and um, representatives. And she said, well, I just got a call from a lady who was coming up with her mom to view the eclipse from Connecticut. And they got into an argument in the car and she was very frustrated. So she called us and we talked it through. We reminded her of her skills and she said, have a nice day. And we went along her way. I was like, well, that's an amazing story. <laughs> So that's an A call that we were able to kind of de-escalate things right there on the spot in the car. Um, it didn't escalate into um, rage, to, 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 you know. And um, so that's I, I mean, she shared yeah. that story with me. Yeah, that's a kind of that's great. Right. concrete. Yeah. 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 Calls. Yeah, yeah, those are fun ones. Those are those are the good ones. Um, we I will say, you know, we we started a couple of years ahead of um, our partnership with Northeast Kingdom and. Um, just last year combined, we received over 10,000 calls and, yeah. so we're, and we're continuing to see those numbers increase and we're partnering with DMH to, to, it's really been that. amazing work you all have done for the 980. Yeah. I look at what other states are just starting to do now. And I'm like, we are way ahead of that. Thanks to all of you. I'm really proud. Like I, my son goes to school in Rochester, New York. When I drive, there's a big nine and eight bolt. Uh, billboard yeah. in the on the New York side, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we, I see that. I'm like, you know what? That's I'm just really proud of that. That people call that with attitude. Our staff answer that phone and, and yeah. help. I just think that's really cool because yeah. it is big. Yeah. It is it's helping a lot of people. Yeah. So challenges in seven minutes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, we talked about workforce. You know, we I do feel like our workforce is stabilizing, but we do still have those 97 vacant positions. Um, many of which of that turnover are in our school partnerships. So we really are trying to invest in our schools to maintain, <laughs> stabilize those partnerships. So that's something I think we're leaning to. Anything specific, Stacey, you want to just kind of tack on there? Uh, no, I would say, I guess, no, but then I'll talk, yes. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, residential. I yeah. would say it's probably our next, because residential work is also extremely tough. It's 365 days a year, 24-7. 
that have it staffed to have people on. Um, and we, as I said, we have 10 sites. And that includes part of our crisis. I consider that part of our crisis that is residential too, because they do come and stay. Uh, so, you know, just yeah. you know, That's great. recruiting for those kinds of roles. And some of those folks are in residential settings because they are not able to live in the other state space, right. uh, which the only other choice would be outside of their community. So you got some really tough, challenging, high acuity clients that um, you're trying to stop 24 seven. So I, I do think that becomes a struggle because a little bit of out pay is, you know, that could push shift their rentals, but it's really hard work. So keeping those staff is so challenging. Uh, mostly schools, residential, and the licensing, as I said, that our mm -hmm. population is kind of hard to keep them just the opportunities are a little bigger. When you have someone come in that trains with you and goes, you sponsor the licensure process and all of that, do you require a commitment from them? Have you thought about that? We, we have thought we about have that. Thought about <laughs> I didn't hear that word. So they were talking about how um, they'll have people come in to the DA system, they'll train them, they'll help license them. <laughs> if they get licensed, then they may move on and do something different, not different, like become really a private different. practice. And I was just asking if they require any type of commitment. Oh, okay. okay. So, I, I mean, there's two ways to think about it. One, um, you heard me mention we sell our culture all the time. Okay. Why people work there. That's why they want to come and work for us. And I don't know if you've ever been forced into doing something that you don't want to do. Oh, yes, I, I have. love that. <laughs> <laughs> And you're very unusual. Yeah. <laughs> and so I do think it could be that yeah, kind of hard. culture. Yeah. And if you have that one person that's making them struggle, you may or may not. Right. Yeah. And no, there's it's... other people on the team. So it's it's like six right. one half. Yeah. I would say. Okay. Probably you get them to stay with other programs, such as I will, uh, this is an absolute true story. Um, one of our nurse practitioners was looking to go elsewhere and we're like, we've got this loan program now. Getting help to pay for your loans, he stayed. That's he's great. Gone and on, you know, and he's got another year. So I, I think those things really, that's where we can kind of put our, but the, right. let's get some commitment from you. I'm not just making you cash to walk right. out the door. Not like internships and um, supervision isn't cash, right. but it's not the same. the same. Yeah. Okay. I was just going to add, we've also been requesting <laughs> um, with two um, folks recently who we've provided them with an opportunity to test out private um, in therapy. And so they're doing it part-time on top of their work with us. And one actually just came to me yesterday and was like, I don't think that's for me. It's like great right. overhead, the, the responsibility, the liability. Yeah. Um, she had a, a pretty tough situation happen on her private practice side that um, I just allowed her to yeah. see the value of working at an agency. I mean, what a, what a unique way of handling that. Like, sure, please try it and stay with us for a little bit. Mm -hmm. That's really great. I'm sure you're a great mother. Yeah. We track a number of people that have left our agency and come back. And typically oh, you share with me, you know, it's two or three a year is kind of was the normal. But no. this last year. Se several years. We probably get 15 to 20 people that return. That's right. great. At, at some point. I, yeah. And they don't leave for a year and come back. Right. There's some level of rehire. Yeah. It says a lot about uh, the organization. I, I, I really think one of the things we, I don't know how if we miss the boat, but that we don't concentrate enough on is leadership training. Yeah. For people that leave. Because I'll tell you, you can create a terrible atmosphere or you can create a great atmosphere. Yeah. And nothing's worse than working for a place that's lousy. Yeah. As opposed to a place that's good. If that place is good. They'll take less less pay. They'll take less benefit just to, exactly. just to work for you. Yeah. On the other hand, they could pay them all the money in the world to work for a poor agency. <laughs> and you, you, you hate it. And, and it all depends on the people. Yeah. It's the old thing, people. You know, you, I don't know if, how, what, um, how much control you had, but the Agency of Human Services recently just gave out home and community-based services grants mm -hmm. and one of the things that so you can pat yourself on the back if you're part of this yeah. one of the things that we did we wrote into our grant and it was approved by the agency human services was we the national council has a middle management academy training 
Oh, yeah. And so we took off and grant money to do that. They're coming in June. We've got three days of leadership training. Yeah. And That's some it. of it's subtle. Some of it's just you know, okay. making a joke, being a guy or gal that's, you know, right. and not a, you know, right. although around here. Okay, great. Let me know. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Don't worry about the clock. Well, well, do we have anything more in here? I want to make sure we we don't brush over the challenges. You all just again honor you all. You there. Were, I think there's four hundred forty thousand for elder care that was kind of is moving its way through. That's going to make a difference mm -hmm. as well. That um, our population is aging. We have one clinician that's dedicated towards providing services to um, older Vermonters where he actually outreaches primarily into people's homes mm -hmm. where they don't have the ability to drive <laughs> in and access therapy and it might not be comfortable with telehealth. So we go to them and we provide that service right there in their home. And um, that's something we want to do more of. We know we need to do more of that. Um, and I think the dollars that are moving through the system will have an impact and really help some people with that. That's too. Great. So that's on the horizon that we're working on. Good. Um, and our committee loves to understand administrative burden. So what are we talking about there? I think with the administrative burden, um, well, we hear from our staff, actually, people leave our agency because they feel like the, the administrative the paperwork is too much. So, <laughs> so if they leave, the paperwork is actually less. And um, and they can provide the same type of service. So what? So so what? Who's requiring the paperwork? Attorney Kim on this one. What is? Okay. It? I know. DMH okay. That's a piece of it. But I think even when we look at our provider agreement, the measures, the data reporting, data is great. It's very important to understand programming and changes that need to happen. But for every single measure. Some direct staff has to click something, add something, write something to be able to pull it out. So having meaningful measures in our contracts is really important. Not having 200 because it's interesting or important, but right. what is it to show how people are better off? You know, get to the yeah. So that is a big piece. You know, you heard of, actually you heard of MSR monthly service reporting. Um, that's a whole lot of information that. Staff have to ask clients once a year, all of those we report it up every month, but it's the staff having to collect that information. Right. right. So that's the biggest thing. Documentation is a big thing. I, I do think um, accountability is really important. So, so, you know, this is not about sure thing. We want to be held accountable. We want to agree on how to be held accountable. And I'm hoping where we agree is some of those are people better off as a result of what we do. So we want, we want to track data, but we want it to be meaningful. We want it to be the right data. And one thing I, I will give DMH a lot of credit for is um, they're moving towards the CCBHC structure, yeah. the Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic. We are all in on that with them. Um, we think that will help to streamline some of the administrative burden. And they're committed to working with all of us to identify areas where we can simplify things. So then our staff can be providing care as opposed to sitting at the computer right. clicking buttons. Um, and that's good for, that's a win for, for all of us. So that is something that we're constantly kind of working on. I think too, if you look at, we've talked about private insurance providers and sort of what the payer mix is a little bit, but that's another area when you get into there, every private insurance has their own intake process, their own outcome measures they want, sometimes their own set of codes they want you to use. It gets very, very complicated quickly. I don't know if that's anything your committee has impact on, but, <laughs> but anything, anything that makes that easier helps. You know, that's, it, mm -hmm. the more that you can bring private insurers into the mix and reduce yeah. the Medicaid burden statewide, that helps, you know, and then facilitating that process uh, being a little bit less tricky to navigate, this is help knowing pushing private insurance and stuff like that is a whole other ball. I have no interest in that. See those books over there? Yeah. Those are all recoding. It's like 24-7. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> through this process, I mean, we've heard it before, but through the process of having all of you in, um, you know, obviously the parity issue is is it's not where it needs to be. It's something that needs to be looked at. Does it? There's a one on one question. You're all doing, all the DAs are doing the exact same thing in terms of reporting and documentation. Yes. 
And, and, okay, so, sorry, I'm just thinking about it. So, is, so you were talking about, is it negotiable? I mean, and who does, how does it work if you're all doing this? We're right in the process right now. Okay. And then all the departments at AHS, so there's a committee with DCP collected from the designated agencies working with the state departments. There's two lawyers on the committee, so we negotiate the whole contract, including measures and mm. uh, reporting. Mm. Okay. And then you're saying that the CCHP process is going to make it better. And are you in that negotiation right now with that too? Yes, that's part of the conversations with a provider agreement. What measures can we let go of that are Vermont grown payment reform? And then what measures are we bringing in for CCBHC? And so remember with CCBHC, it's right um, now a planning okay. grant. Yeah. So, yeah. And then we would still have to apply to actually become like, so there's a planning grant process. That I think has been pushed out to March of 25. Do I have that right? I think they're shooting for 25. Right. And then there's another approval process that they have to go through with the federal government to actually become. Once we prove that we're worthy. Yes. Mm -hmm. no, so that's exactly. what this process is, is, yeah. you know, saying, yes, this is worth funding on a larger scale. Vermont, I think your questions are going, Vermont has a lot of homegrown things, um, outcomes, deliverables, because someone thought it was interesting at one point. Um, and so those things you tend to add things you it's rare that you take things away so over yeah. years and years and years that number has just swelled the thing i like about the fqhc is it's 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 here's a federal here's a grouping of outcomes that are federally required for these dollars it's it works in other states throughout the nation let's just do those and so there's something standard about that standardization i kind of like we give up control um to, to move in that direction, but I feel like it, it's it's working elsewhere. So let's just grab onto that and move in that direction. And I think DMH is totally on board with that too. That's really helpful. Thank you. Any last things from? I just want to thank you guys. I'm glad you're up in Franklin County. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really appreciate no, it. So yeah. Thanks for what you do. I would say the same to all of you. I appreciate yeah. you taking the time to have this discussion and for the work you do. I think being in the legislature is often an incredibly thankless job and you have some tough decisions to make. So thank you. Both. And, and, and I would think that you, knowing, okay, you make these decisions at this level. And then it's kind of what happens next is right. kind of visible. Yeah. So I just want to say it, it, it does make a difference in people's lives. In, this, in our staff, which allows them to provide care to people in need. So I want you to know it's the work you do in here makes a difference and it's it's important. Thank, Thank you for that. Sometimes sure. it's hard to see that. Yeah. Yeah. Alyssa, one last thing, because I track suicide numbers. Um, I don't know if you know, but your two counties actually went down last year. So good work and, and 988 is, I know, you know, with small sample size and everything, but it jumps around. Yeah. 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 We, but important it is important. Yeah. Yeah. We're definitely, we've got an eye on that ball. Yeah. Great. All right. Thank you all very much. And we'll take a break until 